Uh, no? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so it's really great to be here. Uh, I'm very grateful to the organizers for giving me the chance to tell you about some of the work we've been doing in the Bernian lab, um, and particularly on this dual species atom array um, and kind of where we're going with that. So I want to start just by motivating why we would bother to go to the effort of adding, adding all these lasers. Um, and yeah, for this audience, everything we've seen in the last day or so, um, we don't really need to motivate atom array quantum processors, but just to know that we have these identical qubits and tweezers, that gives us a, well, a way to scale to kind of hundreds of atoms. We can have long-lived qubit states in hyperfine or nuclear spin states, and we're seeing really awesome progress in terms of gate and entanglement fidelities, um, now pushing kind of above 99%. So that's really exciting, um, but like all platforms, there are challenges. And two in particular are that measurements are typically long, destructive, not really qubit specific. And over time, as we run deeper and deeper circuits, we have atom loss. And so this is something that we're really going to have to overcome uh, if you want to run really long uh, protocols. So what I hope to do in this talk is to convince you that dual species systems offer potential solutions there in particular because we have far detuned imaging transitions between species that give us low crosstalk measurements. And moreover, we also have far detuned cooling transitions and species selective traps that actually allow us to add atoms back into the system whilst preserving quantum information. On top of that, I want to give ideas for opportunities that arise in these systems, also because we have novel interaction regimes, uh, potential for efficient multi-qubit control, um, and putting all of this together, avenues for auxiliary qubit enabled protocols. So what I will do in the talk is briefly introduce our experiment um, and kind of how we run it. Then I'll talk about our first protocol results implementing this so-called spectator qubit protocol. And I'll tell you about how some of these new capabilities actually allow us to do that. And then finally, I'll tell you about really recent experiments, very raw data we're doing right now. Um, starting to explore interspecies Rydberg interactions. So let's jump into the experiment. Um, our setup looks like this, quite similar to a lot of the other experiments you'll see, uh, with a major distinction being that we have these two independent SLMs that allow us to generate independent traps at 840 nanometers for rubidium and 911 for cesium. And these are sufficiently uh, chosen such that the rubidium traps only load rubidium atoms and the cesium traps only load cesium tra atoms. So we get site selective loading um, where the SLMs define which atoms we get. Uh, we image those through high NA objectives, uh, image the atoms onto an EMCCD. Uh, we can make defect free arra arrays by rearrangement. And we actually do that with a single pair of crossed AODs at 911. Um, because we can basically turn up the intensity to also pick up rubidium atoms. So this is a now kind of outdated image of how the setup used to look. Um, a lot more optics now, but you can kind of see the key features. So uh, we have a 2D source cell at the top. The atoms are then kind of pushed down into our glass cell here. Uh, we have a 3D mod, um, and we have, you can see our kind of high resolution objective. So with this system, uh, we're typically able to trap up to 512 sites. Uh, so here's an average fluorescence image of a 512 site array, where we typically would get 50 to 60% loading in each uh, subarray, which basically tells you that the 3D mods and all these things don't interfere with each other. And we get similar performance to a single species setup. Here you see cesium atoms in yellow and rubidium in blue. And that theme will remain consistent throughout. So just follow that. Because we have SLMs, we can make arbitrary 2D geometries. Uh, so here are a couple of examples. Um, a dressed hexagonal lattice and these kind of famous Chicago landmarks, the Sears Tower and the Beam. This is all, of course, average fluorescence. And we've shown in the past defect free arrangement in 1D of, in this case, I think, cesium atoms, where we're using, we're loading into AODs and compressing um, the row with about 99% success per site. Recently, we've upgraded the system actually to do 2D rearrangement with two species. So this is kind of now all working. So here's an example where we just have row of cesium, rubidium, cesium, rubidium. 
And in turn, we basically use the AODs to pick up one row at a time and to uh, compress them over. We can do more general uh, geometries. So two examples are 87 rubidium written in cesium atoms uh, and our favorite laser in use. So this now works pretty well. And I think this just shows the basic capabilities we have in terms of loading large systems of 2D, uh, uh, 2D arrays with two species. Of course, this is just atoms. And so what I want to come on to now is quantum information and how we can start to encode states in the system um, and manipulate them. And so I'm going to talk about this spectator protocol, um, how we implemented that in our system. But I want to start by just introducing the protocol itself, um, because it's maybe not something that everyone is familiar with. So we can consider a single qubit. Um, here we're looking at the xy projection of, on the block sphere. And uh, we prepare it, for example, in the x state. And we just let it evolve for some time. And if it couples to its environment, maybe we have a quantization axis or so, it will process. And if that environment changes in time, well, what happens in each shot, we acquire a different phase. You now average the shots, you get decoherence. And in general, decoherence is something we want to overcome, of course. We want to suppress these errors. And a kind of interesting situation arises if you now have, say, another set of qubits um, that experience that same noise field. So they undergo some sort of correlated dynamics. Those dynamics don't have to be identical, just correlated. If we can extract some information from the system, we can actually undo the noise in shot to shot. So the way that would be done is, for example, here performing a mid-circuit measurement along the y-axis, from which, on an ensemble of spectators, you can estimate a phase in a single shot. And by doing that, you can then do a real-time correction. So in each shot, you undo the noise. And so this is the key idea between, behind spectator protocols. We have co-located auxiliary qubits that sense a noise environment. We can do real-time phase estimation and then a mid-circuit correction. Of course, this is particularly for correlated errors, um, but you can also tie this in with whatever other error correction schemes you would like to do. Um, a nice thing is that it doesn't need two qubit gates. So that really simplifies things on one hand. But there are some really stringent requirements. So you have to be able to do mid-circuit measurements that do not decohere the data qubits. Those measurements need to be fast compared to the intrinsic dephasing timescales in the system. And you have to have the capability to do real-time data processing and feed-forward operations so that at the end here, you actually correct the state prior to measurement. So we set out to do this in our platform. Um, and I'll show you how we did that. So we encode our quantum states in the hyperfine clock states of rubidium and cesium, respectively, each with their own uh, unique microwave frequency and also own unique optical imaging frequencies. The experiment was done on uh, this array. So we have 221 sites, uh, 100 of which are cesium atoms, and 121 data qubits are rubidium atoms. And you can just see here, for example, that we can drive nice coherent Rabi oscillations on, between the microwave uh, clock states. Uh, and that kind of works pretty standardly. Of course, because of these large frequency separations, we expect to have low crosstalk measurements. But the first thing to do is to actually verify that that is the case. And so the way we do that um, is first by looking at the raw data qubit coherence. So we prepare the data qubits in a superposition state. Uh, we decouple them for some time, in this case, eight pulses. And at the end of that time, we measure the residual coherence. As we do that, what you see is that at early times, we get a clear oscillation. Late times, oscillation is gone. That decays with some characteristic time scale. That's the decoherence rate. And here with eight pulses, it's about 0.7 seconds, so clearly long lived. We're then going to add in this mid circuit measurement and see what happens. So we're going to synchronously decouple the spectator qubits. And then halfway through the sequence, we're going to stop that decoupling sequence, perform measurements on the spectator qubits, while still trying to preserve data qubit uh, coherence. And for fun, we just leave the readout light on for the entire remainder of the duration to see what effect that's actually having on the data coherence. 
In doing so, uh, we get the following. And the really key message here is that these two curves overlap. Even though here we're shining hundreds of milliseconds of readout light on the data qubits, um, there is no additional decoherence. Yeah, Dolip? So the data is rubidium, right? Data is rubidium. And what's the trap we're going to? Uh, 830 in this experiment. Okay. Now 840. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, the key message here no additional decoherence. This far separation of the wavelengths basically gives us extremely low crosstalk measurements. This basically makes sense. You can do a calculation of the expected bit flip rate on a rubidium atom during a 15 millisecond cesium readout, um, and it's actually 1 in 10 to the 11 events. So perhaps this is not so surprising, um, but just seeing it work was a pretty important first step. With this in place, we then set out to implement uh, the spectator qubit protocol. So, oh, and I should also just highlight, as we've heard, there's all these other really cool ways to do mid-circuit readout. Um, that we've been hearing about in the last day. I think one thing that's really cool in our case is just how naturally this comes. We get, it's basically a built-in feature of having all these extra lasers. Um, but of course, there are other ways to do it. So we set out to implement the spectator qubit protocol um, to have a bit of control and understanding over what we were doing. Um, we actually deliberately inject noise with a fixed frequency on our magnetic field coils. But in each shot of the experiment, that noise is applied with a completely random phase, which is not known to us. And so when we do this in our decoupling sequence at certain frequencies, we will be very sensitive. And so within, say, 100 milliseconds, we completely decohere the data qubits from that. We then add in the spectators. So the way we do that is we now, for three quarters of the time, we're synchronously decoupling the spectator qubits. Then at the end, we perform this mid-circuit measurement. This takes about 15 milliseconds. We then process this in real time. It takes about a further 8 milliseconds, mainly in terms of transferring data. And then we fire the correction pulse. And when we do that, we can actually see the clear recovery of the coherence signal, basically showing us that feedforward actually allows us, in this case, to correct for these correlated phase errors. This was really exciting to see in the lab. Um, as I said, in each shot, we didn't know the phase. So there's basically no way we can fudge this. Um, so getting it to work the first time, yeah, that was pretty exciting. During this work, we studied a number of things about these spectator qubit protocols in terms of uh, frequency dependence, infidelity, and all those things. Um, I'm happy to talk about it later, but in the interests of time now, uh, I'm just going to push on so that we do some Rydberg at the end. One other thing we looked at, yeah, Dolip? One more question, sorry. Sure. Um, so can you put a cesium atom and a rubidium atom in the same tweezer if it's like, I guess, like at the same time, if it's at like 900 nanometers or? Yeah, this is a good question. In practice, we don't see it in any of our data. Um, like, can you? Like, what if you wanted to? You can. <laughs> you can. Sure. could. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, yeah, okay, thanks. Well, can you, can you then, no, that's a great, that's a great argument. <laughs> they need to be very cold, <laughs> so sorry, but. But then, but then, so can you, so can you, can you then use, like, what if you did this experiment, but then you put. If you have collisions that change the state. So the collisions will change the state. Yeah. Okay. So you can't use one of them to kind of, like, measure the, okay, never mind. No, but I get are you going towards the idea of, like, correlated trap errors. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, depending what your error source is, like, if it's just intensity noise on your traps, I mean, of course, you can selectively trap in, say, 830 and 911, and then later transfer to, like, 1060 traps um, and just have them in independent trapping arrays but have correlated intensity noise on the arrays. Um, so th there are definitely a lot of potential things that one could do to deal with common mode control errors. Um, in this case, magnetic field noise was a really easy one to do. But yeah, we're definitely interested in those things. If I could just say something to that. Yeah. In our experience in a knee lab, like, I think depending on the hyperfine states, the atoms can interact a lot or cannot interact much at all. And also depending on their emotional states when they're in the same trap. So there might be some potential there. Here you're, you're relying on global readout of a large array to kind of get to get the because each atom is 
is projecting it right now. Yeah, of course. So, so, so if, you have, like, if you're trying to do something on a single trap, you, you, there's no way to get this. Before. No, and that's the whole point. I mean, it has yeah. to be correlated errors. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't necessarily have to be globally correlated in average, right? I mean, if you know that there is some specific gradient across, you can start think about like spatially dependent things. If it's really random shot to shot and you're trying to correct each one by itself, yeah, no, you're going to struggle there. Interesting ideas, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So, one other thing we looked at was losses and over trying to overcome them. So, as I said, in general, in these systems, as you run your algorithm longer and longer, you, it is just inevitable we will lose atoms. And so, trying to come up with ways that allow you to mid circuit replenish lost atoms um, will be really important. And in our case, this was really clear because every time we image, we just blow out on average half the atoms. You can think about doing low loss imaging, but uh, it will never be zero. So we approach this in two ways. Uh, in the first, we actually form a stroboscopic cesium 3D mod whilst decoupling the data qubits. And when we do that, you get the following. Where first looking in blue, uh, we look at the data qubit coherence time. So we start coherent, and over time we lose that coherence with four, four, four pulses, this like, characteristic uh, half a second. The gray line is what happens when we don't have the 3D mod on. And what this is basically coming from is just that our field coils ring. So you have to worry about the gradient coils. Um, so you lose a bit of coherence from that. But with that said, if we look in yellow at the number of spectator qubits, we're actually reloading cesium atoms faster <coughs> than we're losing coherence in the system. So that's already really promising. But something else that we realized we can do that's actually really neat is because we have our 2D mod, um, we can actually cool directly from our atom beam uh, using PGC. So in this case, we don't have to worry at all about our magnetic field coils uh, ringing up and down. We can just decouple the data qubits as we like. So here, just sticking with eight pulses, you see basically no change in the coherence. Um, and actually, uh, just via optical molasses, we load faster um, than through our 3D mod, albeit to a slightly lower fraction of about 30% of sites in this case. And at the time, we thought this was limited by small cooling beams. Um, and actually, since then, we've kind of upgraded the system. So we now have a separate imaging and loading path. The reason for all this is that uh, our imaging beams need to be small to reduce scatter. But of course, you want a large uh, trapping beam. So now we just switch between these using a MEM switch. Um, and we have one millimeter imaging. 10 millimeter loading. So we image much faster also. So from down 40 milliseconds low loss to 15 milliseconds. Um, and we actually load much quicker as well. So we went from about 200 milliseconds to now loading our 3D mod in about 30 milliseconds, having preloaded the 2D mod. And we just do that between our experimental shots. So this gives us cycle rates now up to about 7 hertz, which is also nice just for taking data. Um, but I think, so we haven't done a direct comparison with the measurements I showed before, but I think that will also now be much, much better. Um, so I think there's a lot of promise there. Um, but, yeah. I mean, to be honest, there is not such a, we didn't come up with like a deeper, detailed microscopic model. I think namely just that uh, to understand this better. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we maybe should also just try running the experiment without the 3D mod. It's, it's something we um, just haven't, haven't explored so much uh, because, I mean, to be honest, it's something we just tried <laughs> and, uh, and it worked. So, we could understand like, what, what matters, how it's really fast, how it's really efficient. Yeah. 
this, this is only qualitative, but you just, you just want your initial density in your 2D mapping to be high enough. Because you're, the bed, when yeah. you, your PGC doesn't do any compression, it just does, exactly. it's just like physically yeah. slowing down. Um, whereas what the mod does is kind of the compressing the density. Yeah. So if your starting density is high enough, then, then you can both be sure. zero. But that's also the like, But then sure. you need to make one of that. It's almost non statement. What I'm saying yeah. is like, you know, like what, what density do I need? How cold do I need to be? How much the free yeah, and I mean, I guess what is also not entirely clear to us is that, I mean, our cooling beams were optimized for making the 3D mod and then however that expands over the tweezers, it's not clear if we're really winning because we just have a much larger range of capture velocities or just that where the cooling beams are is actually now just better overlapped or, yeah, so for sure there are better, a better understanding would be a good thing to do. I think in the like original Paris experiments, they loaded from like without even their slower on from just like the vapor, without just molasses, and they could just see atoms coming in. Like, like this back in this 2010, we, the first time we had atoms, we did that. yeah, without any radio. Um, I, th I think it's in. I mean, we tried it because we read it. We just not put on it. Don't see the water, but there is a lot. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> small one. Small one. Yeah. yeah. Okay, in the interest of time, sorry. let's move on to Rydberg. Uh, it's a Rydberg workshop. This data is really raw. Uh, this is really what we're doing right now. But I'd wanted to show what we're up to and kind of where we're headed with that. So, again, for this audience, I really don't need to explain blockade. Um, but what I did want to highlight is the really exciting progress that's been made in the last year or so. Uh, I think these four experiments and others I think will soon follow, uh, where we now have gate and entanglement fidelities exceed, approaching and exceeding 99%. And that's really exciting um, for the field. And of course, we're really excited to get stuck into that. But in our case, there is yet to be a dual element gate. And so we've got to start from the beginning. So I want to start just by introducing some of the quirks and features of dual species interactions, um, which are generally just very interesting. And then I'll talk about where the experiments are. So typically, we're going to be talking about exciting to high-lying end states, where we're always exciting to S states. Um, and so when we have equal n, what's going to happen is we get strong van der Waals interactions scaling as n to the 11 over r to the 6. And so we get this hierarchy of energies where rubidium, rubidium, cesium, cesium, rubidium, cesium are all pretty comparable. Um, and yeah, things behave fairly similarly to a single species. An interesting thing that happens for uh, dual species is you now get Forster resonances. So we're talking about near degenerate Rydberg pair states that can actually have resonant dipole dipole interactions, which scale really, really differently. So now n to the 4 over r cubed. Um, and so what you can see is that in this case, just dropping from 68, 68 to 68, 67, um, you go from this kind of everything scaling like this to a really qualitatively different regime um, where you have strong asymmetry here between interspecies and intraspecies interactions. And okay, if we're talking about high fidelity gates, there's clearly a lot of optimization to do here and understanding which uh, combinations of states and n levels and all these things will make a huge difference. Um, but just generally speaking, this is really exciting, and I think uh, there's a lot to be said about efficient multi qubit gates and things along that avenue. So, for example, you can think about having weak data data interactions, strong data auxiliary actions, where you're actually now doing parallel gates. One thing that's complicated about Forster resonances, though, is that they depend on lots of things. So angles between atoms, magnetic fields, electric fields. And that's cool because it means you can tune lots of parameters to optimize the interactions. So for example, to get higher asymmetry or lower asymmetry, or to have fast fall off at the end or really long tails. But of course, to get all that, you have to have a good handle over these tuning knobs. And something that in the field uh, has often been difficult is electric fields. Um, and so one thing that's a bit unique about our experiment is that we actually built a Faraday cage into it um, that serves two purposes. So first, it allows us to suppress stray fields from outside the experiment. And secondly, we can actually use it to apply uh, deliberate electric fields. 
So here you can see some console simulations that we expect about a thousand uh, fold suppression of external fields inside the cage. Um, here you actually see a photo of the uh, cage before it went into the glass cell. Um, and spoiler alert, we have Rydberg excitation, um, and we were actually able to show that we can uh, stark tune our Rydberg levels. Uh, so you see this kind of classic quadratic stark shift. So we're really excited going forward um, to see what we can do there and um, for all the regimes that this might open up. But let's jump into the experiments in the time I've got left. So our excitation experiment looks something like this, uh, fairly Standard, we have two uh, pairs of counter-propagating beams, uh, 420 and 1013 for rubidium, 1059, 456 for cesium. Uh, all the experiments I'm going to show are performed on uh, five rubidium cesium dimers. Um, all our lasers are PDH locked to one ULE cavity. There is no filter cavity, but we do have noise eaters on all the, uh, in terms of intensity noise. And that gives us about a percent intensity fluctuations of worst. And we do all our alignment. These beams are quite tightly focused, say 10 to 30 microns, um, by AC stark shifts on the clock states. So all of the work I will show is uh, using these levels. So we're exciting out of 4, 0, and 2, 0 um, via sigma plus sigma minus. We got our first Rydberg excitation on single species in uh, February, uh, right before March meeting. You can see things started out not great. Um, but over the last couple of months, we've been really trying to improve this. Obviously, still work to do, but getting better. So right before March meeting, uh, firstly, we realized we were accidentally interacting. So that was a good first sign, but also not ideal. So removing those interactions and focusing better helped spending a lot of time moving A to circular polarization, but B better in intensity balancing, working on alignment. We got faster and more stable. Then working on lasers, Rydberg detection losses. Uh, we're starting to get A faster and B more coherent. And now on a typical day, this is kind of like a standard calibration measurement. So still some work to do, but we have two megahertz Rabi frequencies on each, driven dephasing timescales of about 10 microseconds, and uh, we think we understand where we're limited by. So predominantly, this is all stemming from the issue of optical pumping into the clock state. We don't have our Raman systems installed yet. We just received the lasers, which means we're actually doing pi-polarized pumping into the clock states, which turns out to be really hard. Um, so we get quite some heating from this, um, and that's explaining a lot of the missing contrast here. So we just got the lasers, and I think getting those into the system will... Uh, also really accelerate efforts there. We had to try to make them interact. So here you can see we can drive cesium oscillations. Uh, we can find a pi time. We can then drive our rubidium oscillations. Um, and then putting these two things together, we can try and blockade. And what you see is that when we do that, uh, we really suppress the uh, rubidium oscillation. So we see really clear evidence that we have good blockade. At this spacing, 4 microns uh, blockade should be about 40 megahertz compared to our 2 megahertz. So that should be pretty good, but we need to characterize this uh, more carefully still. The last thing I want to show... And how does that compare to... I know you, you kind of had the pair of uh, How does that compare to that uh, So. For this case specifically, these dimers are A, really far apart, because we do want to be able to scan them to look at the interaction strength. So right now, the pairs are 40 microns apart, so that's basically gone. Right, but I guess I mean like these particular um, selection of the Rupert state? Sure. So at this spacing, uh, they would all be pretty comparable. So rubidium cesium would be slightly bigger than the other two, um, but not so far off. OK, so the very last thing I wanted to show, as a, this is really data that came off the setup at the end of last week. Uh, we started putting together hyperfine and Rydberg pulses. And just starting, I think we've heard all about in the last day or so that this is really what we should not be doing, but it's a place to start. <laughs> um, so we're doing a pi 2 pi pi scheme. 
uh, where we excite first the cesium atom, the rubidium atom, and the cesium atom. And this is a little bit easier for us because uh, the independent addressing wavelengths mean we can do this semi-globally. Um, but combining this with hyperfine pulses, um, we expect to see a conditional rotation, and that is indeed what we see. So here you're looking at the Zx correlations between cesium and rubidium, right? So this is the expected Bell state we prepare, and these are the non-zero expectation values for that state. And you can see really clearly that dependent on the cesium measurement outcome, we can see that conditional phase. So it's clear that in the coming weeks and months, we've got a lot of work to do to really push the numbers here, but I think this is a really exciting first sign from this experiment. So with that, I think I'm really out of time, so I'll wrap up. Um, just want to say that I think the key message from this is that uh, mid-circuit operations are something that come very naturally in this system, and combining this with uh, multi-qubit or two-qubit gates naturally lends to quantum non-demolition measurement through entanglement. So jumping through quickly, um, basically working towards stabilizer measurements uh, is a really obvious uh, goal for us, and I think that's where we will head. But on top of that, uh, there's a lot of really other exciting things to look at in this platform that are just different. Um, so efficient ways to generate uh, large multi-qubit states, be that GHC, cluster states, and similar things. Uh, error correction in surface codes, uh, quantum advantage through things like shallow circuit sampling, um, and also just adding dissipation is something that comes quite easily, um, so system bath dynamics. So we're really excited for what will follow, um, and we're also very happy to hear ideas uh, from the community. So with that, I just want to thank you for listening, of course, to thank the team, so Hannes, and especially the Atom Array Lab, Kevin Shradha, who I think many of you met, uh, Ryan and Vikram, and of course, the wider group. but we have like, a few minutes for some more. Yeah. Why is Manuel in the picture? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't a boy. Were you there? Am I? Oh, yeah, I yeah, am. Yeah. <laughs> have, you, have you thought about uh, other gate protocols closer to the LP gate or something that would, would work for it? Yeah, so I mean, there are subtleties to global addressing with individual beams that I think we have to understand better. I think a lot of that maybe stems from uh, just us getting the system more stable in terms of AC stock ships and these things like alignment. Um, I think as we do that better, those schemes become more and more uh, clear winners, right? Just not having the ground Rydberg dephasing sensitivity would be, a, I mean, that's almost certainly going to be the first thing that limits us right now. I think either or. Um, I think it's clear that having motion to get connectivity is very nice. Um, it's probably also the case that movement can be a bit slow at times, so you probably don't want to move to do everything. Um, so I think a mixture of the two. Uh, yeah. I have another question that I'm not sure I know the answer. I wonder if it's not a problem. You showed that you can do the readout. Mm -hmm. so the readout doesn't disrupt the coherence of the electrons, uh, but it's still taking a certain amount of time. And yeah. Sometime, yes. So you're going to lose some coherence while you read up. Yeah. So, so how much loss of coherence are we allowed to have, say, the surface code? Not so much. Yeah, not so much. Uh, I mean, well below a percent. Uh, is, I, mean, you, I mean, you can talk about thresholds, but practic, practic, I mean, I guess the threshold, the kind of 1.1% is for both measurements and gate errors, I believe. Is it okay? I actually didn't know that. It's a, it's a few I guess you looked at this for the. Or something like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
But, but this is also, but that is the measurement error, right? I mean, this is the dephasing error beyond which you're, right now I run my stabilizer on. Well, I mean, if it's, so it could, if it's dephasing, it could be correlated and that could be a problem. But neglecting that, I think you just treat it as a single qubit error that happens on your data qubits sure. while you measure the ancillas. Mm -hmm. Then I think it's, it's probably, I mean, this is in the Spalwer 2012 paper, but it's probably yeah. a few percent. Okay. Okay. In practice, it has to be well below a percent. You'll have to lose Yeah, and, and we already are. Um, I mean, practice, practically, you can push this coherence a long way. Um, I mean, I think eventually you probably want to sit in 1060 tweezers anyway for everything. Uh, you get power. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, just a, a question about the, the dual squeeze interaction. Mm -hmm. It looks like now your quantization axis and your internuclear axis are kind of aligned. Yeah. Have you taken a run at, at, at not aligning those and seeing if the interaction gets messier? Yeah, so, I mean, there, <laughs> for sure it will get messier. <laughs> Um, if anything that one calculates is true, yeah, it will get much weaker. Uh, I mean, there is a magic angle somewhere. Um, right now, we haven't looked at that. We will get to that. Um, I mean, along that axis is where the interaction is stronger, which for these first gates is the nice place to be. Uh, but yes, I mean, there's all the interesting topological physics that comes out of uh, these things.